Well, it's a great personal pleasure for me to introduce John Cohn to uh, speak about the upcoming election. John is the director of polling and the polling editor at the Washington Post. Prior to joining the Post in 2006, he was the assistant polling director at ABC News in New York, where he claims the food rivals Berkeley. And also, he was the associate survey director before that at the Public Policy Institute of California in San Francisco. John has an MA in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, our own department. He's a graduate of John Hopkins University. He and I have published a couple of papers together, and uh, he lives around the corner from me when he's in Berkeley at his parents' home, and uh, he's a very close friend as well as someone who I think is doing great polling and great analysis while at the Post. His talk today is entitled War and Terrorism as Issues in the 2008 Election. And after John makes his remarks, I think we can take questions from the floor rather than with the cards in this case. And John, you handle the questions yourself. And John says he'll be happy to take uh, questions not only on his remarks, but more generally on the role of polling in the election and on the election in general. So please join me in welcoming John Cohen. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be out of Washington for at least a couple days. This is what we call the silly season there, and it's um, quite intense and stressful. Only 46 more days to go, um, unless there's a recount, of course, but we don't get too scared about that yet. Um, but it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's kind of like being out of the salt mines for a minute. I did give myself a whole day to acclimate, which is much better than the Cal football team did last weekend when they went to Maryland. Um, I was unfortunately at that game. <laughs> It was not fun. Um, you know, th this is less of a talk than a series of remarks and thoughts that I've had uh, really after completing our last poll um, last week, which was a post-Labor Day, post-convention poll, and you know, remarking on the title about war and terrorism in the 2008 election, and with the irony being that the economy has become overwhelmingly the number one issue uh, facing the country, and you know, kind of you know, thinking about war and terrorism, which I think are key drivers but really you know, kind of stepping back and understanding how they've shaped um, why where we are today, why, why we are where we are today, um, and also where we are going forward. I think even though the economy, the sputtering economy, um, has become voters' top concern, we cannot fundamentally understand our political climate or why Barack Obama and John McCain are the party's nominees without grasping public opinion on the Iraq war. Secondly, it's um, impossible to clearly assess the current campaign strategies without looking closely at all three of the post-9-11 elections, making public assessments of the U.S. campaign against terrorism absolutely essential to our understanding. Um, third, and perhaps most easily missed in those top-line numbers about the economy, is that while Iraq and terrorism has has, have both faded as preeminent issues, they remain really important drivers. And at, toward the end, I'll get to where McCain and Obama um, compare on those issues. But I first want to set the stage. Um, the economy is obviously front and center, something that's only been heightened this week um, with the crisis. Thankfully, the Dow is up today um, significantly for those of you who are closer to retirement age, including my parents. Um, and you know, kind of how, how the, uh, the economy and the resulting campaign scramble, which we see really for proper messaging, in our poll last week, about four in 10 voters called the economy the single most important um, issue in their vote. Among the ubiquitous, now ubiquitous daily trackers, you actually look at the economy as an issue this week, and it's increasing during just this week alone. In our last poll, uh, the percentage of registered voters calling the Iraq war their single most important voting issue dipped all the way to 10%, barely clinging on to um, double digits. That's a remarkable turnaround from just a year before when across polls, the Iraq war was you know, beating the economy on that score by three or four to one. In Gallup data, Gallup every month asks not as a voting issue, but what's the single most important issue um, facing the country? The Iraq war had a three-year run as the country's most important issue. Um, that ended only in February of this year. 
Um, this week, uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell went so far as to say, the war is gone as an issue. It was a rather remarkable um, statement, and there was a headline on a popular news site that won a whole lot of clicks this week with a story topped, why the war in Iraq doesn't matter. I'm here to say that it does, and it's certainly um, one of the main reasons why it matters is because it has mattered so much for the country for the past five years. Iraq is the a main reason about um, where we are politically, and it's the, the, in the so-called atmospherics that analysts talk about so much. It really is the plummeting public opinion about the war. It is the primary reason that Bush's approval ratings are so low. Professor Jacobson put up a slide earlier really tracking the decline in public assessments of the war and how closely correlated those are with um, Bush's approval ratings. Certainly, three years ago, um, the fumbled federal response, to put it nicely, to Katrina um, accelerated the decline in the short term, but the trajectory was really set primarily um, by the war in Iraq. Bush hasn't had majority approval in our poll in 45 months. It's a really remarkable number, surpassing Truman's record of 39 months um, from 1949 to 1952. The president's approval rating in our poll hasn't topped 40% um, in more than two years now. And if you look at, uh, over time, the decline of Bush's approval rating and how tightly uh, related they are, back to Professor Jacobs' side, slide to declining attitudes about the war, really year by year, you have this amazing decline, and it does track rather closely to the decline in Lyndon Johnson's approval ratings year by year in the Vietnam War as increasing percentages of Americans started to call that war a mistake. Um, Iraq and uh, the president's low approval ratings are also a main reason why so many Americans are now saying that we're pretty seriously off on the wrong track. That's reached record numbers in almost all polls that I've seen. It's, again, one of these atmospherics, but it really frames where we are um, now. Um, Iraq, therefore, is a big reason the landscape proved so favorable to Barack Obama when he was deciding to run for uh, president in the summer of 2006. Change, I argue, um, has proved such a successful theme. It's not a unique argument, of course, but um, change is such a successful theme um, primarily because of the overwhelmingly negative views of the president and the state of the country. And you see in the new McCain-Palin strategy coming out of their convention um, that they also see it as you know, kind of the one way to win. And in our, in our poll last week that we put out, we saw McCain uh, making up a lot of ground on Obama as the candidate who would do more to bring change to Washington, and uh, initial success, at least, of, of his campaign strategy. Iraq, of course, may have also played a more, public opinion about Iraq, of course, may have also played a more direct role um, in Obama's deciding to run for president, but to know for sure, we'll probably have to wait for his third book. Um, you know, by 2006, when he was making up his mind, attitudes had deteriorated dramatically, particularly among Democrats, and uh, this morning you saw some of those slides. Um, but also crucially among independents. In the summer of 2006, uh, more than eight in 10 Democrats and sizable majority of independents said the US was not making significant progress toward restoring civil order in Iraq. Obama, who opposed the war and the original congressional authorization, which our second panel took up, uh, from the outset saw the shifting political views um, as an opportunity, particularly when his leading rivals for the nomination uh, were original supporters of that intervention uh, that had become so deeply popular among Democrats and particularly liberal Democrats. Uh, that opportunity in many ways was confirmed by the 2006 midterm elections. Iraq, in contrast to today, was clearly the top issue in that election, and Democrats um, turned negative views on the war into a winning strategy to take back both houses of Congress. In that election, they won independent voters by 18 percentage points. According to that year's exit poll, two-thirds of independents opposed the war, and 70% of those voters went Democratic. It was really a remarkable turn um, in campaign strategy when you had independents breaking for one side or the other by such wide margins. That had not been true in 2000 or 2004. In fact, much of the strategy um, the Republican and Democratic campaigns put out were base mobilization strategies in 2004. You may remember those well. And uh, independents, as a political movement were kind of forgotten about in campaign strategy, that calculus changed dramatically in 2006, and this real race for these voters who at least nominally described themselves as political independent. Um, 
Iraq is also a main reason why Obama won his party's nomination. Uh, throughout the pre-primary polling that we did, Clinton's so-called original sin in backing the intervention did not prove decisive, but Iraq was Obama's single best issue in our polling of the hypothetical non-existent national electorate, which we can talk about um, later, but also well in pre-primary polling that we did in New Hampshire and pre-caucus polling um, in Iowa. But if you look across um, exit polls, that there were about 30 uh, states that had Democratic exit polls this year. If you look across those, Obama won 53% of so-called Iraq voters, those who said Iraq was their uh, main voting issue. Clinton won 42% of those voters. By contrast, Clinton won uh, slim majorities of, the, of all Democratic uh, primary and caucus voters who prioritized the economy or health care. I think the war in Iraq was also a, um, and Republican positive views toward the war in Iraq, also buoyed McCain when his campaign was basically flatlining uh, toward the end of 2007. Um, excuse me, yes, 2007, I got my years written down wrong here. I've been, I've been polling the same contest since uh, late 06, and it's, it's getting to be quite long. Um, so when, when McCain was, McCain ran fifth in our polling um, in December of 07, but he was still tops at that time among um, leaned Republicans, those who identify themselves as Republican or independents leaning toward the GOP. But he was tops on Iraq. You know, he more trusted him to handle Iraq than any of his rivals. And he was competitive with Giuliani on terrorism. He fared far worse on the economy. And I would say that if, if the economy were as bad now, um, were as bad then as it is now, we probably would not see uh, McCain prevailing among what some argue was a weak field. And McCain was similarly catapulted to the top of the national polls following his big win in New Hampshire, primarily on the strength of his core advantages over his rivals on Iraq, terrorism, and international affairs. He was, after New Hampshire in our national polling, he was just tied with three others as um, who would be best on the economy, you know, just splitting the vote evenly between Giuliani, um, with Giuliani, Huckabee, and Romney. More Republicans at that time said they trusted no one or had no opinion than mentioned any of those four candidates. So you know, the economy, if it had been as bad um, then, would have really you know, changed the nature of that campaign. Uh, similarly, the McCain's uh, strong point in the GOP primaries across those that had exit polls was really the war in Iraq. 52% of voters who called it their top issue uh, voted for McCain. He also won across the other issues that were on the Republican exit polls, which um, included illegal immigration, but by far uh, slimmer margins. Now, we fundamentally, as we start to shift toward um, going forward in the next 46 days, I also think it's important to talk more about what happened in 2006 as well as what happened in 2002 and 2004, because it really is framing the way that the campaigns are approaching uh, voters over this crucial final period. Um, Iraq, as a specific issue, is very different now than it was in 2006, even before the recent thaw in public sentiment about current conditions that I'll get to. In 2006, uh, the democratic strategy was essentially Iraq was a bad war. Most of you think it was a mistake to go vote for us as a sort of collective punishment on the Republicans. They were relying on that retrospective judgment um, about the original decision to go to war, and fundamentally, it worked. The problem now, five years into the war in Iraq, is that it's harder to take a backward look, and it's becoming certainly more essential to look forward. That's more so, um, even more so true with, uh, without Bush on the ballot, and we can talk more about that, but it's probably one reason why we don't have uh, Jeb Bush on the ballot is the negative ratings of his brother and also uh, just the overwhelming negative views of the Iraq war and the, re and the need to kind of shift to what to do in Iraq now. Public opinion is settled about the decision to go to war. There were slides put up earlier where you have about six in 10 voters and all adults um, respectively saying that it was the war, um, the war's costs were not worth um, the fight. And that's been relatively settled for a long time now. What's far less clear is what to do now in Iraq is the unsettled uh, public opinion matches kind of how complicated the decision uh, or, you know, the kind of what to do, how complicated it is to actually figure out what we should do now. 
Um, last we asked, voters were evenly divided between the candidates' uh, competing plans for troop withdrawals. Professor Jacobson also put up, you know, kind of other slides showing far um, less partisanship in the views of uh, kind of what to do going forward because it's so much more complicated. So that's 2006. Iraq was the top issue, but it's a much more complicated one now. When we look back at 02 and 04, terrorism really prevailed as the top issue, no matter what you might have heard from the 2004 exit poll and all the whole kerfuffle about moral values. We can talk about that at some other point. But the key issue in that election was um, overwhelmingly the US campaign against terrorism. If you look at just a couple data points from that exit polls, other than the flawed um, issues question, 49% uh, of voters on election day, in, including those who they interviewed um, in some absentee, absentee voters in some states, 49% said they trusted only Bush to handle terrorism. 97% of those people actually voted for Bush. So if you do the math on that, that's 48% of the electorate. He won with 51%. He only needed another 3% from the, all the um, ancillary issues involved. Of course, that's a game you can play with uh, any of these crosstabs, but terrorism being the top issue, I think it's uh, particularly pertinent. Um, terrorism may again have been headed to uh, be the number one issue in 06. I mentioned that it was Iraq. Around, the time, around this time in 2006, right out on, around the fifth anniversary of 9-11, Iraq was really coming up as an issue. 16% of uh, our poll respondents at that time called it the single most important issue in their vote. That was double what it had been the weeks before, and I think a reflection of changed Republican messaging coming out of uh, Labor Day in 06, and they were really trying to make that election about terrorism. And I think it, it may have, they may have succeeded, and it would have um, become an election about terrorism had they not suffered great collateral damage from corruption scandals uh, for those of you who remember Tom Foley and Mark, um, you know it's, it, it remains a core GOP belief that they can that they can win on terrorism. I'll get to later McCain's advantage on the issue over Barack Obama, and you know, they clearly think that they won um, in '02 and '04 because of the issue, and felt that they were making great progress on that in '06. And were they not um, shaken in their effort to? kind of bring up terrorism an issue, they may have uh, at least kind of held on to more seats than they did and maybe held on to Congress. Now, what's different now than uh, to, on opinion about Iraq and terrorism than in previous elections is that the decision, while the decision to go to war remains settled in the public mind, there's been a sharp turnaround um, in public assessments about how things are going now. About six in 10 um, continue to say the war was not worth fighting, as I mentioned. And that's been a majority view in our polling for nearly four years, uh, just a remarkable run. Um, nevertheless, 56% of voters now say that um, the United States is making significant strides toward restoring civil order in Iraq. That's the highest proportion to say so in nearly three years, and double the level in late 06 uh, before President Bush ordered additional tr American troops uh, to the region as part of the so-called surge. Even among Democrats, we now have 38% saying that the United States is making significant progress toward restoring civil order, that too is about double um, the pre-surge level among Democrats. What's different now on terrorism is that we have relatively low levels of um, fear about terrorist attacks here. Seven years after 9-11, concerns about a major attack in this country have subsided to their lowest level since 97, actually, in our polling. Um, while ratings of the U.S. campaign against terrorism have uh, um, improved from the relatively subdued levels over the last two years. Nevertheless, worry about terrorism remains widespread, with about two-thirds apprehensive about the possibility of another major attack. Um, but that's down 10 points from two years ago, and high-level worry uh, in particular is notably down. All told, in our poll that we released last week, 62% of Americans say the U.S. campaign against terrorism is going well, up from a low of 52% uh, just two years ago. Another thing that's happened and a big change uh, for this election is a decoupling in the public mind of the war in Iraq and the war on terrorism. On the night of Bush's surge speech, which I believe was January 10th of 2007, the public was evenly divided about whether success in Iraq was critical to uh, the United States winning the war on terrorism. As of this summer, 60% said that it was not necessary. By contrast, more than half um, still say that it's necessary, it's essential that 
the United States succeed in Afghanistan to succeed in the broader conflict. Um, the Afghan war, in contrast to Iraq, is one uh, where a slim majority of Americans still see it as worth fighting. And now all the way forward to today, um, as of our poll last week, and I should say for context, this was a poll that we took uh, immediately after the Republican convention. We had a bit of a, a bounce for McCain. We have not polled since then. There have been other polls out this week essentially showing in those polls the race exactly where it is, that it's exactly where it is now. It is now exactly where it was in uh, mid-August, so whatever we picked up may not be there, but there were some interesting things in that, and we'll see if they hold uh, when I get back to the salt mines tomorrow. Um, uh, McCain, as of last week, held advantages on handling um, the Iraq war and on terrorism. He's had a consistent edge on handling terrorism, much as Bush did over Kerry in 2004, although Kerry did manage to close the gap against Bush uh, toward the end of the campaign. In our most recent poll, McCain is up 20 points on the question of whom voters trust uh, more to handle the U.S. campaign against terrorism. He also, in that poll, held uh, a 10-point advantage on handling the war in Iraq. It was the first time in our polling throughout the campaign that either candidate had a clear edge. In all of our previous polling, they were essentially um, tied on the question. McCain's 10-point uh, edge was remarkable, in part, uh, driven by the improving attitudes uh, toward the progress that the United States is seemingly making toward restoring that civil order in Iraq. Could also be some of that post-convention bump. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, McCain in our polling also has uh, the advantage on broader international affairs more broadly. Also, he's the candidate more voters trust in an unexpected major crisis, and he is uh, widely seen as having a uh, better knowledge or deeper knowledge of world affairs. Um, his biggest advantage, of course, and one that Obama likely have to make great strides on between now and election day is on the question of uh, who, would be, who would make a better commander in chief. Um, McCain's advantage on that is dramatic. And uh, when we last asked Obama kind of, you know, how would he do you know, independent if he can't compete directly with McCain, does he have the chops to do the job? And it was, the voters were essentially evenly divided on the question. It's essentially um, parallel to when we ask, does he have enough experience to serve effectively as president? We also get a relatively split judgment on that question. It's one that um, we've argued in print many times that he needs to improve on, even if he's not, not gonna, ever gonna be seen as as experienced as McCain, because that's a more factual question. But you know, kind of convincing enough voters that he does um, have the pedigree to serve um, as a good president, and we'll look for movement on that question. Um, on the flip side, Obama had a big advantage the last time we asked on who would do more to improve uh, the United States image abroad, and on energy, which the McCain-Palin campaign coming out of their convention have pitched as a core national security issue. Uh, Obama held an advantage for most of the year, albeit a slim one. But uh, in our last poll last week, um, the two were, candidates were about even on that. All of this is going to be topic number one in next week's debate. The first, uh, presidential, the first of three presidential debates is next Friday night, and the topic is foreign policy and national security. So although the economy is on top of voters' minds now, on the top, first out of the candidates' mouths will be about national security and foreign policy. And I think it's essential that we understand um, that they're on the stage next week, in prime, primarily in my view, because of the deteriorating attitudes about the war in Iraq among Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents, and also the positive views um, toward the Iraq war among Republicans, and also McCain's relative advantage on those issues. Um, I've managed to uh, speed through this, and hopefully we have a lot of time for your questions, and I've managed not to talk about the horse race at all, which pleases me greatly. I, I try to uh, de-emphasize that as much as I can and focus on the broader themes, and having the microphone and not having editors um, with me has allowed me to do that. So uh, thank you very much, and open it up to politics broadly and polling, and happy to do everything. I'm going to ask you about the horse race. Um, oh, great. No, actually, it's more of a, a general question about polling. You sort of alluded to in your talk when you said, here are my numbers, but here's what's happened this week. And, right. And there's been a dramatic shift in how polling's conducted. I think 
even since the last election. And could you talk a little bit about how, as a news organization, um, you're dealing with in terms of how you set up your polling? That you know, now there's I know there's probably like 12 daily trackers now, in addition to the plethora of other polls. I'm just kind of curious how it's affected what you guys are doing. If you could talk a little bit about about that. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a great question. There, I mean, there's so many polls out there now, and you know, the, they're of widely varying quality. Let me talk first about what uh, we do at The Post, and then I'll expand it to my other job uh, um, there, which is to essentially vet other surveys to make sure that we're not just, you know, that we're, that we're doing justice to American public opinion and properly informing our readers. Um, what we do is essentially what we have always done, which is landline telephone um, surveys of random samples of American adults. We have experimented this year. There's the big question about whether cell phones uh, matter. We have been experimenting with that. In our August poll, we included a parallel sample of cell phone only users. It didn't make a difference. Um, it didn't make a significant difference. It made a small difference on the margin. My counterpart at ABC actually took the opportunity to blog about it today. Um, I recommend that to you. But we've experimented with that. We're experimenting with other things, you know, to kind of to stay on top of uh, the technological challenge that we face. But as a Northern Californian, I always feel that technological challenges have technological solutions, and we're experimenting with those. Um, in t so we essentially haven't changed, you know, much of what we do, and we think the data, you know, justify continuing that approach. Of course, there's a wide range of methodologies out there. My primary complaint with most of the polling that's out there is that it's remarkably shallow, and that even these daily trackers and others that ask the horse race question and a couple demographics, and they're all over the map. And so, you know, in my view, it essentially doesn't matter, certainly in a national poll, whether Obama's up two, you know, Obama's up one, McCain's up two. It's just, you know, we can obsess about that, and any analyst can pull whatever poll they want and support, you know, their argument about why things are happening the way they are. But there are very few polls even ask about the top issues, about the, ask about the candidates head-to-head -head on foreign and domestic policy. And so that, that's a real lack. So I try to steer um, reporters, and I try not to pay atten too much attention myself, to polls that really don't offer um, any substance. And that's a lot of them. And there's also, you know, kind of a wide range of methodologies and you know, I, I, I advise you know, our reporters internally on what methodologies I think you know, are reliable um, you know, gauges of public opinion in which aren't. Am I answering your question? Do the large states, uh, do the states with large populations influence the polls more than the, say, key states when it comes to politics and trying to determine the opinions in those states in terms of the election? Um, sure. Our, 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 our national polls are designed to be nationally represented. So certainly there'd be more people um, polled in California than New Mexico, although New Mexico may have a great deal um, more to say about who wins the presidency than California. But certainly in our national polling, you know, we, we get representative um, numbers there. But again, our goal with the national polls is not to predict who's going to win, but to talk about the broader themes um, in the election, which I think are relevant to electorates in states large and small and help us understand what's gonna happen. And it's fundamentally having good polling that not necessarily predict who's gonna win, but tell us why in the end. 